quiet tax revolution is gaining momentum in Pennsylvania. Five cities are taxing real estate in a unique way, taxing land more heavily than buildings. Pittsburgh, Scranton, Harrisburg, McKeesport, and Newcastle are taxing land at double, triple, and even six times the rate on buildings. It looks like such a good way to deal with the inequities and bad effects of conventional property taxes that many other cities in Pennsylvania and across the country want to get into the act. America's cities are plagued with slums, shortages of affordable housing, blighted commercial areas, concentrations of welfare clients, inadequate revenues, and flight to the suburbs. We have a proliferation of taxes that have pushed the businesses out, make it very prohibitive for businesses to come into this city. Some critics, like Philadelphia Councilman James Tyone, say local tax systems share a good deal of the blame for these urban problems. For instance, we have the wage tax, use and occupancy tax, that's a horrendous tax, nuisance taxes, property taxes. We're confused. We save up enough money to make our home look nice, and what thanks do we get? They immediately raised our assessment, and now we have to pay more taxes on it. It's not fair. Professor Stephen Cord of Indiana University of Pennsylvania and one of the prime movers in Pennsylvania's new approach sympathizes. An owner who just sits on prime city land and keeps it idle is rewarded with low property taxes. And yet he can make big speculative unearned profits by selling it at some future time. Uh, what about the man who builds on his uh, uh, central city site? Uh, he puts up office buildings and housing, and uh, he is penalized by high taxes year after year, not just once. Public discontent over property taxes forced many states and localities to set legal limits on rates and revenues. This remedy proves painful, however, when funds for essential local services run dry. Professor Cord explains how the Pennsylvania alternative improves the property tax and permits it to be used to bring in additional revenues. Look first at how the current uh, property tax operates. Uh, you take the value of the land and add to that the value of the building and you get a total property value. Then you have a tax rate in the community and you multiply that tax rate, a certain percentage, times the total property value and that's what the property owner pays each year. Our two-rate tax starts with the same two assessments. But instead of applying a single tax rate, a city imposes a lower rate on buildings and a higher rate on land. This makes the tax less painful to the majority of taxpayers. And it also makes the property tax much more palatable politically when revenues must be increased. Because the two-rate tax is introduced in gradual steps or grades, some call it the graded tax. Others call it the differential or split-rate tax. Does taxing buildings less than land really make a difference? Take a house and lot worth $100,000 and a bare lot worth the same amount. Under the old system, with a tax rate of 2%, or 20 mills, as they say in Pennsylvania, both properties owe $2,000. If the new system has a 1% tax rate on buildings and 5% on land, the bare lot owes $5,000 and the homeowner's tax drops to $1,800. By giving tax breaks to those who use land well, this reform lets the profit motive work for cities instead of against them. It's such a great idea, how come it hasn't happened all over? Philip Finkelstein, city administrator and educator raised this provocative question at a municipal finance conference at historic Valley Forge shortly before his untimely death. One answer to his question is that new ideas, no matter how good, tend to meet resistance. Also, some people frankly dislike higher land taxes. This view is expressed by Allentown publisher Donald Miller, who is also a founder and co-owner of a network of downtown parking lots. They're trying to force people to uh, put uh, everything into buildings. 
Everybody's looking for a free ride on land, but they're not looking for earnings. They're looking for capital gains, and you're not going to change that gambling instinct. They've been speculating on land in the United States since they came over on the Mayflower. Large landholders have used their political clout to make landholding one of the most tax-sheltered of all investments, and they have blocked efforts to change this favored status. Another hurdle to adoption of the two-rate tax has been a long prevalent notion that city problems should be cured mainly through regulatory restrictions and federal aid. Only recently have the shortcomings of those approaches led to a new philosophy that is more attuned to local tax reform. Namely, that cities should do more to help themselves and that the public and private sectors should work as partners to promote local economies. Legal obstacles to the two-rate tax exist in many states. Efforts are underway around the country to enact laws and constitutional amendments giving localities the option to up-tax land and down-tax buildings. They are following Pennsylvania's lead, where the state legislature has provided local option and home rule powers allowing cities to use the two-rate tax. However, as a member of the governor's cabinet indicates, the state has not actively promoted this reform. Tax reform is an issue that has been talked about and worked on in Harrisburg for some 10 years. We concluded that land value taxation was worth looking at. And we urged that as we set up the housing task force, that they consider it as one of the issues that they would look at for further study. We feel that by far the greatest obstacle to local tax reform is that officials and citizens have not been informed about the two-rate tax alternative. And that's our mission right now, to show how this Pennsylvania-style tax revolt is affecting housing, municipal finance, land use, economic growth, and jobs. Congressman Coyne of Pittsburgh supports this mission. The most impressive thing about this land tax to me is that it was put to its test during a severe national recession and with a crisis in the steel industry in our region. And yet in the five cities in which it was tested, the comparable figures were very favorable in the cities that adopted the land tax reform. How do we measure a city's performance? Uh, I've done it by comparing the city's uh, construction before and after the introduction of the two-rate tax and then by comparing that record, that construction record, to that of similar neighboring cities. Of course, we should exclude non-taxable properties like uh, government, church, uh, hospital properties. Now, each one of these cities in Pennsylvania keep records of building permits uh, issued. Bill Weissert in McKeesport, for example, keeps such records for his city, and they are records of construction that goes on each year in these cities. Now, the cities that have used the two-rate tax system. We go first to Scranton. It's had a modest two-rate tax for 70 years. When federal funding was cut back, Scranton raised its tax rate on land to four times higher than the rate on buildings. Mayor McNulty describes its effects. We're really used to it. Uh, people don't even recognize that it's, that, it, that it's in place in the city of Scranton. We've increased uh, the rate uh, four times as of 1980, and uh, as a result, uh, we've had a uh, tremendous increase in the number of uh, building permits in, in the city uh, for the years 1980 and 81, uh, with an increase of uh, uh, up to 22 percent in the city of Scranton, while in our neighboring city of Wilkes-Barre, which is just 14 miles down the Susquehanna Valley, uh, there's been a drop of uh, 44 percent over the last three years. Uh, I believe that one of the main reasons for that is that the builder is no longer penalized in the city of Scranton. We've experienced uh, positive developments from this. We've achieved... Austin Burke, president of Scranton's Chamber of Commerce, here, explains how this uh, tax attracts new business. One, it would lower the cost for the initial period to industry uh, by having such a tax set up. The second reason is, is it gives a sign to industry that the community 
wants development here. John Kelly, head of a real estate and property management firm, tells how Scranton's tax encourages housing construction and jobs. Taxes affect jobs. In my real estate business, I've seen how land that's under tax remains idle, and idle lands mean idle hands. Soon on this center city property will arise a four-story building that will provide permanent jobs for dozens of people in the offices and stores that will be built here. Speculative land values have forced the price of housing higher and higher and higher. A heavy land tax and a reduced tax on the building would take the speculative profit out of this and make housing cheaper, more affordable, more available. Interestingly, arguments over the two-rate tax in Scranton focus on how fast to move toward a property tax on land only, not on how to get rid of it. I've come full circle on this idea and uh, have advocated that we have no tax on uh, buildings or improvements at all and just tax the land in order to create jobs and in order to uh, uh, have the development of the total community. Uh, our Chamber of Commerce opposed that for two reasons. One, it was too precipitate a move. We would have rather have uh, a land-only tax phased in over several years. And this would give us an opportunity to work on the second area of our concern, and that was the fact that we have some assessment problems here that we'd like to straighten out before we go to this land-only tax. Even cities that haven't adopted the two-rate tax find it obvious that high building taxes discourage construction. So they offer tax abatements or exemptions to selected new development. The city of Philadelphia is probably one of the most progressive in the state today with commercial building. Why? It isn't shifting taxes from land or from building to land. It's shifting or it's providing a tax exemption so those buildings can be built on a five-year tax exemption on those improvements. Good. The same issue. It's not really the same thing. The two-rate tax goes further. It reduces tax penalties on all buildings, old and new, large and small, commercial, residential, and industrial. And it reduces tax penalties for the life of the building. Also, abatements fail to correct the excessively low land taxes which foster inappropriate uses of central city locations. That may be a one-family house in the middle of high-rises, and maybe a porno strip on the outskirts of just about every downtown of every size in this country. And what is a porno strip except a land speculation because it's a way of getting a lot of income from bad buildings to get a lot of turnover, or slum housing, or worse yet, open-air parking downtown. In 1974, Harrisburg was strapped for funds. Land values in the state capital were falling. Harold Swenson, who was then mayor, instituted the two-rate tax. Now an investment counselor, Swenson looks at his city's impressive renewal. During my two terms as mayor, we had two decreases in taxes on improvements and two increases in taxes on land. The net result was a reduction in tax on most every single residential property and it brings about improvements like this here. The split level tax in Harrisburg helps bring about construction like this. The expensive cost of holding vacant land is offset when the lower tax rate is applied to the improvements. And after all, the lower tax rate is really what counts in this business. Mayor Reed, Swenson's successor, agrees that the two rate tax is one of the important tools for restoring the health of a city. Well, I think it's very safe to say that uh, a, on major business and residential development projects that the separate uh, or differential tax rate favoring buildings as opposed to land makes a big financial difference and therefore becomes one of a number of incentives which the city of Harrisburg offers to stimulate private investment. Bottom line though is that we have found in the city of Harrisburg that having a higher tax on land, which in fact promotes uh, development when there's a lower tax on buildings, is conducive for good development, particularly in an urban setting. We strongly recommend that local governments throughout the country, particularly urban governments, uh, consider the differential uh, tax rate, which uh, we strongly endorse. Philip Finkelstein's experience as deputy administrator of New York City led him to conclude that land is an especially appropriate target 
for local taxes. Everything else can disappear. Buildings can deteriorate, they can empty, they can even burn. And there are shells of buildings in every city. Taxing buildings, taxing sales, taxing income, taxing wages, taxing anything that can move is one sure bet that it's going to move. McKeesport is a rugged steel city on the Monongahela. Across the river are two similar mill cities, Duquesne and Clareton. All three cities were hard hit by steel shutdowns. All hovered near bankruptcy. Mayor Lou Washowitz describes the conditions. McKeesport basically is, is living through a difficult, uh, almost a depression era, very difficult economic hard times. The unemployment rate is staggering over 20% at this time. And I, as mayor of the city of McKeesport, have lived with this for the last four years. It was decided by city council to go to a land tax at 90 mills and a tax on the structure of the building at 20 mills. This had advantages and disadvantages, and I've had still till this time have some reservations about how has this worked for the city of McKeesport. The new tax at least succeeded in producing 50% more revenue, getting McKeesport out of debt, while nearby mill towns had to cut back on police and other basic services. During these rough times, it is no surprise that building investment fell 14% in Duquesne and 30% in Clareton. What seems remarkable, despite the mayor's wait-and-see attitude, is that McKeesport, after adopting the two-rate tax, saw the value of its building permits rise 36%. Administering the two-rate tax has posed no special problems. David Zawanitz of Philadelphia, one of the state's top assessment officials, explains why this is so. It's no big deal to tax buildings and land separately at different rates. We're already assessing them and breaking them down in our assessment bills separately. And if city council were to pass a bill and instruct us to tax land and buildings at different rates tomorrow, within weeks, we could have our computers working so that we could send out accurate bills and it would be no difficulty whatsoever. In the midst of Newcastle's first blizzard, after his election as mayor, Dale Yoho comments on his city's two-rate tax. To encourage development, the city of Newcastle has adopted a land value tax. Over the years since this was instituted, uh, there is a definite pattern of growth in buildings in the downtown area. Currently, we are taxing property at 48 mills and land at 25.8 mills. The city's building permits increased. 13% in number and 3% in dollar value. The two nearest comparable cities, permits fell 13% and 21% in number, and 37% and 77% in value. The mayor also pinpointed a shortcoming of Pennsylvania's property tax reform. The one problem that Newcastle has with this is there's currently three taxing bodies in the city of Newcastle, the city itself, the school district, and the county of Lawrence. Newcastle is the only taxing body that has instituted the land value tax. In Pennsylvania, school districts are taxing jurisdictions, but they cannot use the two-rate system. Neither can counties, boroughs, or townships. So far, only cities can tax land and buildings at different rates. State Representative Frank Serafini is a leader in legislative efforts to extend the tax reform option from municipalities to all other levels of local government. My colleagues have recently shown great interest in this form of taxation, which has provided an increase in construction in those cities which have adopted this taxing method. In Newcastle and elsewhere, study after study has shown that most homeowners benefit from shifting taxes off buildings and onto land values. This raises questions. There's been much discussion about the 80% who are going to be paying less, and that's great, and that's very American, and we can all cheer and say, hooray, that's really neat. But if my arithmetic serves me correctly, if 80% are le paying less, and you're getting the same or more money, as I've seen in some of those articles, 20% are paying a hell of a lot more. 
residential property owners don't pay, as you pointed out, a hell of a lot more. If they pay more, it's a minimal amount more, in my experience. And second of all, uh, by and large, those are the people who are financially uh, more able to pay. Homeowners are the biggest group of property taxpayers. But the bulk of the tax is paid by business and industry, which occupy prime urban locations. That's why some experts say it would be good politics and good economics to abolish the tax on housing as soon as feasible. Gee, what a great idea would be if we simply said, no more tax on houses. Just take houses out of the property tax arena completely. Do what you want with your house. Fix it up, build a mansion, finish the attic, add a toilet, close off the porch. Pittsburgh, the largest American city using the two-rate tax, introduced it slowly and gradually. After World War II, when Pittsburgh led the nation in privately financed urban renewal, then-Mayor David Lawrence credited this form of property tax with creating favorable incentives. By the mid-1970s, however, Pittsburgh faced a serious budget crisis. Congressman Coyne, then a city councilman, spearheaded the drive for higher land taxes. The alternative was a wage tax that was going to cost the average worker $225 more a year in taxes. By holding the building tax rate constant and increasing the land tax enough to produce the same revenue as the proposed wage tax, average homeowners only had to pay $84 more a year in taxes. Councilman William Russell Robinson has paid special attention to Pittsburgh's housing problems. I don't think there's any doubt that the land tax has helped to stimulate the rehabilitation of housing in the city of Pittsburgh. We're the only major metropolitan city that has the land tax. I think we're showing the way to other cities, and uh, once again, Pittsburgh's in the forefront. So I'm very excited about the land tax and firm advocate of it, and I think that it's going to really, really prove in the future to be one of those kind of taxing mechanisms that's going to save some of our urban areas. And also, we're going to get the support, I think, of a lot of people who right now are a little skeptical once they begin to see that this tax is indeed uh, predictable and it's dependable. Dan Sullivan, a small businessman and promoter of the two-rate tax in Pittsburgh, suggests why big landowners often do not oppose this reform. It's easy to convince somebody that land tax is a good thing if their property saves money. Homeowners, people with big skyscrapers. The more difficult task and the one that's really important to making this successful is convincing people whose properties pay more. There are a lot of reasons why, even if your property pays more, land tax could be good for you. If we get rid of things like the amusement tax or taxes that fall on people who come down here and shop or come down here and live in town, there'd be much better business here. And it's a lot better for a property owner to pay a high tax in an area where business is good than to pay a low tax in an area where business is mediocre. Pittsburgh raised its land tax to four times its building tax rate in 1979. In 1980, the land tax was five times the building rate. In 1982, six times the building rate. Fortune magazine reports that new construction rose 14% the first year of the increase, 212% the second year, and 600% the next. We shifted taxes off of homeowners and off our most productive enterprises. When housing construction nationwide and in the rest of our metropolitan area was in a slump, Pittsburgh kept building. I don't think it's an accident and our housing costs are among the lowest of any large city in the nation. I don't claim that our corporations would not have built new headquarters without the two-rate tax, but many might have located out in the countryside, eating up precious farmland. We have an exciting, vigorous business district. Many in Pittsburgh, like City Council President Robert Ray Stone, were skeptical at first about relying more heavily on land taxes. Since a land tax is kind of a new, uh, a new idea or a revitalized that kind of idea, there's a natural uh, question of whether or not it does adversely affect anyone. Anything that new needs a little bit of review. But I think that uh, after that, uh, no governmental official need fear it. And I think the benefits are there at the end of the road, and I'm sure they have no fears at all with it. 
we have seen quite a range of cities. Industrial McKeesport and Newcastle, with populations in the 30,000s. Medium-sized Harrisburg and Scranton, with 53,000 and 87,000 people, respectively. And Pittsburgh, with half a million people. It seems noteworthy that in every case, after instituting major hikes in their land tax rates, each of these cities began experiencing substantially greater economic activity. Pittsburgh, Scranton, and McKeesport alone recorded three quarters of a billion dollars worth of new private construction in 1980, 81, and 82, over and above their building investments in the three previous years. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, this extra investment translates into at least 5,800 full-time construction jobs a year for each of the years surveyed. Nobody claims the two-rate tax is a ticket to instant urban paradise. All five cities still have their share of problems, but they now have a potent new tool for dealing with them. There's no telling how soon this will be a tale of six cities or 60. But this quiet property tax revolution, to the accompaniment of happy noises of cities getting their faces lifted, has clearly taken root in Pennsylvania.